Welcome to BizTech Investors Conversation Show. Today we have as our guest, Adam Reynolds. He's the CEO of Saxo Asia Pacific, and he's our special guest to discuss the company's remarkable growth, its recent milestones, and their strategies for success. Now, Saxo recently surpassed 100 billion in client assets and gained over 1 million clients in the past year. We explore the initiatives that contributed to this achievement and how Saxo differentiates itself in a very competitive financial industry. Now, with that, back to uh, welcome back to Bistac Asia, Adam. Thanks, Brian. Great to be back. Now, Adam, it's been over a year since you last appeared on our show. Could you give us an update on Saxo and the initiatives your company has embarked since then? Sure. Yeah, it's been a it's been a very interesting last twelve months, and as you mentioned. We've just hit a few milestones with a with hundred billion dollars of client assets and passing a million clients, which is a great uh, testament to the trust that our clients have with us. And that's really been what we have built our, our whole business on over a, a period of time. That growing trust uh, element that we can provide to our clients that they feel very comfortable with Saxo. That's also being highlighted by a recent investment grade rating that we've got from Standard Poor's. And being awarded the strategic or systemically uh, important financial institution uh, status in uh, in the last week or so. So all of these things have come uh, at the same time, and they're really recognition of how Saxo has grown and become more important globally as a broker in the market. Um, okay. So uh, I want to interrupt you here because this is something that's very crucial that not many people are aware of. What is the significance of being designated a systematically important financial institution? So it, it was something that grew out of the great financial crisis in 2007 to 2009, and it was decided by all of the world's central banks and governments that they would designate some organisation as systemically important, um, which was effectively a way of them saying that they were too big to fail and that the governments were giving implicit although not explicit support to those organisations. And that implicit support uh, comes at a cost for us, uh, as it does for all of the CIFIs. And that cost is that we have to hold more capital, uh, but that also then makes us more safe as an organisation. Of course, Saxo has an amazingly high amount of capital. I mean, our, our tier one capital levels are in the mid twenties when we're they're more than double what they need to be, um, which is also part of the reason that we, we get such a strong credit rating uh, for a small organisation. Um, so the additional capital is not a burden really for us at all, um, but it does signify that we are seen as important uh, in the market and uh, that we are having a level of implicit support. Now, can I ask you then, these are very significant milestones, these three, the 100 billion, the 1 million clients and the significantly you know, important financial sector uh, designation, very key importance. What were the key reasons for these successes? Yeah, it's, it, it's a really good story. So we, we've been growing very strongly really since 2019. Since we became much more focused on uh, providing a strong investor uh, client uh, product to our existing trader client product. So our trader clients love us already. We, you know, we do a lot of foreign exchange for them. We do futures, we do options. Uh, we've become a, a lot more competitive on our pricing, significantly more competitive on our pricing. Um, and you know that that has helped us along the way, but we're really starting to fill in that gap between you know the the privileged or premier banking sector and the um, and the and the private banks for investor clients now as well because they they appreciate uh, our platform that we have such a wide range of assets that we have such a wide range of geographies and that they can invest you know very safely with an organisation like Saxo but through a fully digital platform unlike most of the legacy banks. And so this is the interesting thing, right? Because in your last show, we talked about, in the last show that you were on, we talked about your new technology platform. So obviously being an innovator and leveraging on technology has really helped you enhance your customer experience. And obviously I think deliver a more personalized financial uh, 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 delivery to each customer. That's, that's absolutely right, Brian. So what we've made, what we've done a lot of in the last two to three years is develop how we digitize content that is helpful and educational to our clients and that is relevant to them. You know, we want our content to be timely, we want it to be relevant. 
Uh, but we also want it to be engaging and actionable for them so that they can look at the content and think, okay, this is something interesting for me in the market. So obviously at the moment, you know, subjects like AI or all the ESG subjects uh, are very important. Perhaps last year it was more focused around EVs uh, and batteries and so on. And, and, you know, these different themes develop over time. Uh, you know, finding the, the clients that those things are relevant for and giving them good quality content uh, is, a, is a big part of it. And rather than bombarding everyone with the content, we, we have AI ourselves that decides who is who the content is relevant for. That's been a big part of a strong improvement in our NPS scores that we've been having across the globe over the last 18 months. So this really helps you then to be a lot more client-centric because I can just imagine, and, and as you've been explaining this, I'm thinking about Amazon and, and personalization. Essentially, that's what you're doing. Essentially, that's what we're doing. Yes, and we always looking to improve on that, Brian. You know, there's lots of different ways, and I'm sure that we will get new AI techniques to to find something that's relevant. But delivering huge amounts of irrelevant content is not what we want to do. We want to find what's relevant for you, and the way we do that is to look at what you're looking at in the platform, look at what you're investing in, and making sure that we're not turning around and trying to bombard you with foreign exchange content for argument's sake when you have no interest in doing FX, you're more interested in investing in tech. You know, that's how we that's how we think about it. And that's how we look at our universe of clients as different personas that we give those sorts of um, uh, content differentiation to. Now, Adam, still looking back on your successes, where has the growth come for you in, in the Asia Pacific region? And which customer segments do you see the strongest growth? So when, when we look at our customers, we look at uh, we look at traders. We look at two types of traders. We look at uh, the specialist traders. You know, there's a lot of them here in Singapore. A lot of them focused on commodities uh, and FX. A lot of them fo focused on rates as well, because Singapore has a strong fixed income and commodities and currencies background. Um, so a lot of people who are in Singapore have worked in that industry. So that's the specialist trader set. We also have what we call the explorative traders. Uh, they're more like macro traders looking for different themes in the market. They may hop from trading indexes one day to commodities another day to FX another day, depending on what, what global themes are occurring. You know, we've got inflation as a theme, so they may be looking at shorting bonds one day and, uh, and buying commodities the next day. Those sorts of explorative traders tend to, to have a very different, actually, mindset and trading style than a specialist trader who is always just trading oil or something along that line. And then on the, on the investor side, and by an investor, we're talking about someone who really goes long only. Um, you know, they, they're not looking at short positions. They're not really trading leverage, though they may be using leverage to increase the size of their long positions. So we also have uh, active investors. Those are the three real target segments for us in the market here and across the region. Uh, and where we're seeing the growth, Singapore has been a great growth story since 2019. We've grown uh, to more than triple the size that we were in 2019 in terms of number of clients and in terms of the assets. And uh, in 2022, which was a tough year for the industry, we held our own. I think we outperformed all of the annual reports I've seen so far. We were significantly outperforming them uh, year on year. So that's good. Um, but uh, we've also seen very strong growth in Australia. And for us, us Australia is, a, uh, is an important market and we can see that uh, continuing to grow. We've done a lot of good work in Japan on improving our platform for the Japanese market. And so we see that as being a potential growth engine for us going forward uh, as the Japanese market becomes more focused on outbound investment. Now, how are you going to, looking ahead now, there's a lot of innovation in your space. There's a lot of young companies coming in, a lot of fintechs trying to eat at incumbents like you and of course, traditional banks as well. How are you looking to stay ahead of the game? Yeah, so so this is why trust is such an important element of our offering, Brian. You know, we we are not wanting to compete with the uh, um, you know with the the more recent entrants to the market for the very small sized accounts, the millennials and so on. Um, you know, we we like to get them, of course, and we like to give them a service, but yeah, you know, we're not going to offer our services for free because that's not our business model to give away a lot for free and then hope we can monetize at some stage in the future. So we are looking for people with a little bit more experience, uh, with a little bit more uh, wealth perhaps, and with a little bit more of a, of a need for high quality content to come to us. So we get a lot of switches coming to us after they've started in the market 
uh, with some of the newer brokers, quite often they'll switch to Saxo when they start looking to get serious. Now, looking ahead as well, where do you see opportunities for Saxo in the next 12 to 24 months? It, it, it's a great question. Actually, you know, in Singapore, we see the opportunity getting involved with the uh, SRS and CPF uh, uh, investment scheme. Um, there, we, we want to become an investment administrator for the CPF investment scheme. And that's a um, huge pool of money. It is a huge pool of money. Unfortunately, at the moment, the local banks are very protective of that and they don't let any foreign owned institutions in. But we've been working hard with uh, the regulators and the local uh, authorities to, to get access to that. And we hope to get that sometime in the very near future. Now, looking ahead, we've got uh, a very, very murky global economic climate right now. Whether it's geopolitical risk, it's economic risk, it's credit tightening. Um, I, I don't want to say crystal ball, but what are your thoughts on, on what investors should be watching out for in the next 12 to 24 months? So it, it is a really great question. I think it's a very difficult investment environment at the moment for people. Uh, and you know, there's some uh, optimists who think that the geopolitics may die down at some stage, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really one of them. I think that you know, this geopolitical environment is here to stay well past the next uh, US election. And, uh, and so I don't see any uh, move back towards globalization. So on that basis, you know, I see that Japan and India are two beneficiaries of the geopolitical situation at the moment. And, and they have been performing quite strongly uh, over the last six months. And I see them as being good opportunities uh, from, a, from a regional perspective uh, for people to invest in, and probably South Korea as well as a reasonable uh, place to invest. Unfortunately, Southeast Asia, where we're based, uh, has been underperforming uh, and has continued to underperform. Uh, and of course, China and Hong Kong have been underperforming even more over the last six to 12 month period. So we're not seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of the benefits uh, of a China return uh, post COVID across Southeast Asia and across uh, China and Hong Kong. Um, but we are seeing the benefits of geopolitical challenges in Korea, in India, and in Japan. And of course, you know, the Australian market is caught somewhere in between, so it's performing okay, but nothing uh, particularly special. And the, the reduction in inflation uh, and uh, the slowdown in commodity prices has been not helping Australia too much at all. I think outside of that, you know, the, the return of uh, tech and the, the rebound in the NASDAQ and the very high quality tech names is, is super interesting. And of course, that leads us on to the stories around AI and potentially in the future quantum computing uh, and how they are going to be the dominant drivers of growth going forward. And there's quite a lot of themes there that you've identified. I want to zoom in on one or two of these, though. Sure. First thing is Japan. So you and I are old enough to remember Japan when Japan was going to rule the world and then bubble economy hit and then you had literally 30 years of, of stagnation in Japan. Is this recovery now, and Japan has performed so well, as you mentioned, this year, is that, a, 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 a bub is, is, is that just a, a blip in the overall uh, uh, landscape or is there really a shift in investor sentiment towards Japan again? I, I think there's the start of a shift in investor sentiment, but I think you know Japan suffered for a very long period of time whilst they were in uh, negative inflation and, and deflation and disinflation uh, from a very strong currency. And when you have a very strong currency for a long period of time, your companies learn to adapt and to become very efficient when you have a strong currency and they've learned to to deal with having that strong currency problem um because it you know they've had had to deal with that and remain globally competitive in their exports yeah. now that they've got a weak currency and rates are higher everywhere and japan's not really suffering the same from uh, levels of inflation yet um you know they they're really reaping in the benefits of that uh, of that weak currency and you know the bank of japan doesn't seem ready at all to step away from their yield curve control or from the way that they have been uh, you know, controlling interest rates at, a, a, at or near zero for quite some time. So I think that the yen will stay relatively weak, but the Japan market will continue to be strong. 
once the Bank of Japan does decide that rates are allowed to move higher, I think then it becomes a little bit more challenging um, because I think the yen will suddenly strengthen again. Um, but I'm not convinced that we're going to see a return to the old style yen strength. Uh, it may be that we get a period of yen strength and then you know we, we, we go sideways for a while after that. But it will certainly be a huge increase in volatility when the Bank of Japan steps away from the yield curve control. And that's when you probably need to be thinking about taking profits on Japanese exposures. Then the the new kid on the block that's that's really sucking investment away from China. We've got to talk about India. Now, that's everyone's darling right now. But as a normal investor, it's very hard for us to invest in India as well and Indian equities. Um, how do how do we play the, the India game? And, and do you think that the India story is a compelling enough story? Some have likened this to, to, to uh, India, to China in 1990. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that comparison. And I, I, I quite like that comparison, Brian. I think it's a reasonable comparison. I think that we don't have the same geopolitical challenges with India at the moment uh, that we have with China. I'm not convinced that if India gets up towards the size of China in terms of the economy and starts challenging the US, that the US will still be as friendly to India if uh, if India starts to <laughs> also be challenging for the number one economy in the world. Well, we'll see when that happens, but there, we're a long way away from that now. So for me, investing in India, yes, it's difficult to invest in individual names in India, especially uh, from outside India. But there are some you know, good mutual funds and ETFs, and, and really we've got a lot of them on our platform. And so I look through those to find where I, uh, I invest, and, and that's how I get my exposure to India. Adam, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for coming on the show. But before you leave, any final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, look, I, I think it, it remains a very uh, uh, a challenging investment envi uh, environment with a lot of sharp pullbacks and a very bearish market. You know, if you read uh, uh, financial Twitter a lot, you'll see that people are overwhelmingly bearish. You know, that they think that the unwind of the Fed balance sheet, they think that the higher rates is going to send the world into a tailspin and a recession and markets are going to collapse. And they've been saying this fairly consistently for the last 18 months. Uh, so I think it's difficult, uh, but I think you know, at the moment, um, you know, keeping risk levels relatively moderate uh, and not taking positions that you're going to get squeezed out of is, uh, is important. So make sure you trade to your risk appetite rather than going all in and uh, doing the big YOLO and, and just having everything like uh, people were doing back in 2021. And I, I think that I'm going to take that advice that trade to your own risk appetite. That's a very important key takeaway. Adam, thank you very much for coming on the show. Always a pleasure, Brian. And thank you so much for having me again. We've been speaking to Adam Reynolds, the Chief Executive Officer, Asia Pacific at Saxo. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to Bistax Investor Conversation Show. This interview will be on our website, www.bistax.asia as well as our social media platforms. It'll also be on our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.